Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Vietnam Innovators. I'm your host, Hao. Thank you for supporting the show week in and week out. Without you and your viewership, the show definitely would not be possible. So if you have any comments and feedback, always leave them in the comments, and we'd love to hear from you and check them out. Uh, today, we have a guest from Hanoi, Dr. Raymond Gordon. He's the Vice Chancellor and President of British University Vietnam. Uh, it's a relatively new university in Ho uh, Hanoi, rather. Uh, they're opening a campus or exploring one in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, but maybe they can talk about that later. Um, but here in Hanoi, they've been around for a few years and a lot of work to be done still, a uh, really new brand and campus. Um, but I've been there myself and it's probably one of the most, if not the most state-of-the-art campus in all of Vietnam. Go check it out, it's an Echo Park. Dr. Ray. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much and I appreciate the opportunity. For sure. Today, as you know, the, the podcast is all about innovation in Vietnam. And when we think about education, there's a lot of room for innovation, a need for it, and a lot of want for innovation in Vietnam. And in consideration of BUV, we see it from a different uh, a number of different angles, at least from my perspective. We see it in the environment. We see it in how education is taught. Um, and that reflects in the kind of students that are coming. So um, why don't we just start there? Talk about your background first, what, what led you to Vietnam even, and um, what motivated you to have this, pursue this kind of change in this kind of setting? Sure, so I'll first of all, start a little bit about me. I haven't always been um, an academic. Mm. I was gonna use the word boffin then, that's a British term, sure. which refers to uh, someone who's an academic. Uh, I spent uh, the first 25 mm -hmm. years of my life working in industry as a professional. Okay. And um, that entire time, you would say, I, uh, I never really left uh. university. Uh, eventually, it moved through, you know, uh, a bachelor's degree and working, and then uh, moved on to a, into, out of a, I was an engineer, actually, and, and then moved towards uh, management and management of people and resources and so forth and hence then a need to to uh, to learn more about management and in particular the management of resources and people which then led to an MBA and then from there uh, I moved in sales and marketing and general management and different companies a number of startups as well and uh, and then I was uh, enrolled in a PhD I was fortunate enough or talented enough to uh, to successfully publish as a student in one of the leading journals in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my PhD was in leadership and power mm. within organisations. And uh, the university I was studying at, because of that publication, immediately offered me a, a tenured position. Amazing. Yeah, sure. So you immediately so. graduated, essentially. <laughs> no, no. I, 25 years I still had to get career. the PhD, but, okay, um, but uh, um, they wanted to capture you, whatever you I was doing. You give me a lot of doing. hope. <laughs> uh, sure. Ray, if I, if I may call you Ray, um, yeah, sure. I've been working in the professional industry for 10 years now. Mm -hmm. I've been in the private sector. It's all about capitalism and, and building cool things and innovating. But my, my heart does yearn to go back to study at some point. Yeah, Not sure. now, but eventually, perhaps at BUV. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I think a lot of our audience here, you know, they, they have questions about why go into, you know, higher education even mm. these days. You know, there's a lot about a lot of debate about that or even pursuing higher education. And I think sharing your, your story about yeah, sure. hey, it's okay to be in private sector and move and vice yeah, versa perhaps. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, actually it's a, it's a great question because mm. it, it, it highlights, uh, it was really a sort of a personal thing too. At that particular mm. point in, in time in my yeah. life, I was in particular studying leadership and power. I was always um, motivated, motivated by these leaders in industry and so forth. But when I found myself sitting next to them, I actually began to question them mm, and yeah. what they were doing. So it was a personal thing for me at that point. I really needed to go back and, uh, and explore that, mm. you know, deconstruct it and try to work out what it is that was irking me in my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, when the PhD started, it was, uh, it was about leadership. But through that, um, if you like, discovery, or through the research, I uh, found out it was more about power. Mm. And then, PhD, mm. uh, tenured position at the University of Technology, Sydney at that stage. 
and then moving into Aquedine. And it was wonderful. It was like a second life, mm-hmm. if you like, uh, and uh, began to satisfy those personal needs that one has about uh, making a contribution, about discovery, about finding out about oneself and about others as well. Right. We could probably have an entire yeah, different on. podcast about leadership. And I'm actually very curious about this topic as well yeah, and the yeah. difference of power and all that too. Yeah, sure. um, myself, I'm 31 now, first time CEO. Mm-hmm. Perhaps the last. Let's see how how long I go. But um, yeah, it's over glorified in a bit. I would say, like being a CEO or a leader. And once you at get the same there. time, once you get there. But what do you do about that once you're in that position? Because it's it's obviously a huge responsibility. You know, the the PNL depends on you, the organization's mission and vision, mm-hmm. and all that. Which leads me to my next question. Sure. By the way. In the context of BUV in particular, uh, a very big mission. How can it be geared towards meeting the dynamic needs of the modern Vietnamese workforce? That's at the end of the day what BUV is trying to accomplish, is graduating the next um, capable and talented generation that can meet the challenges yeah, of what sure. Vietnam demands. So I'd yeah. love to hear your thought about that. Okay, yeah. So most organizations create a vision and mission, and that's as far as it goes. Mm. You know, they don't necessarily follow it and and uh, engage with it uh, where for me uh, from what I've learned both as a practitioner and as an academic the mission is more than that the mission actually tells your student in universities it tells the students but most importantly for an organization it tells the staff what you actually do every organization that I've led the first thing that I've done is go around and ask the staff what is it that we do and that will immediately tell you whether that organisation is focused on its mission. Now, the most important thing about a mission then also is that it needs to be a position statement. You know, it needs to be your marketing position statement. Well, let's say smart organisations ensure that the mission is actually a marketing position statement, where they want to be and what they want to do in that particular organisation relative to competitors in order to make a contribution and to remain sustainable. Mm. And so for BUV, we need to know for our mission, what is it? What type of graduates do we need to produce so that they will be successful in the future and they'll have great opportunities when they graduate? Mm. For me, running a university is about graduate outcomes. When When a student graduates, what's going to be the outcomes. Everything you do in your student experience, all the way to, it's all about how many doors will be open for those students Mm. when they graduate. And so hence, the world's changing, radically changing. And by the way, we're about to move into another epoch Mm -hmm. through AI. So we need to produce graduates who can deal and and thrive in a destable, radically changing, but also exciting world. Let's talk about that because uh, big mission and vision, BUV, how do we do that? How does BUV do that? Uh, especially, uh, you mentioned like AI and the need to innovate or at least keep up with that innovation. Yeah, sure. Let's hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So when we talk about innovation, we, we have students and first and foremost, they need to acquire the skills and the knowledge that's about, that underpins their discipline whether it's business or whether it's medicine or whether it's design, creativity, or whether it's computer science. They need those disciplines. More to the point now, we're focused a lot on cross disciplines as well. But then having those disciplines won't be enough in the future. It's all about how will they be able to apply them. Mm -hmm. So then in order to meet that mission statement, what we recognise at BUV is we need a, a, a very different type of teaching. You know, we need, a, we need a form of teaching and a student experience which focuses on innovation mm-hmm. and how do we actually do that. So in that sense, it's not just about acquiring those skills, it's how they're going to use them when they get out. So what underpins every discipline, whether it's, as I just said, business, medicine, so forth, mm-hmm. is, if you like, forms of ideation, Mm -hmm. you know, it's about collaboration. So for our teachers, we very much, we train our teachers and we select our teachers, our academics, and the research that we do is all about, okay, we have a group of students, but we bring them together 
in the classroom. And in fact, if you come to BUV, you'll see we have round tables. Mm -hmm. And the technology is embedded in the tables as well, so they can all plug in and, and so forth. So what our teachers are interested in, okay, we give them the knowledge and the skills, if you like the foundation, history of knowledge and in their particular disciplines. But then we'll give them problems and challenges and opportunities. And then the teacher is interested in facilitating what goes on when they come together so that through collaboration they can discover new things. I, I have a side question. You mentioned outcomes. Yeah. I, I love how you think about that because a lot of all types of organizations, not just education, sometimes Absolutely. forgets yeah. why you're doing something. It's not just to learn. It's to learn for an outcome, especially for the people yeah, sure, receiving that education. So my question for you would be, BUV and the staff and the teachers have a huge pedigree of knowledge and mm. experience. Now, what have those outcomes been for BUV so far in, in your eyes? And I know the graduating classes have yet to mature in the sense of sure. like 10, 15, 20 years, but what have those been those outcomes that you can you can maybe note for our audience to kind of highlight and take yeah, away? Yeah, sure. Well, first and foremost, it's whether or not they get great jobs. Mm. Those graduates are in demand. Um, but it's more than that too. Mm -hmm. You know, we like to, for me, it, I take great pleasure in seeing our graduates uh, out there making change and they remain in contact with us as well, the types of people that they become. Another thing too about focusing on the outcomes, the outcomes never remain, or the outcomes, your positioning never remains stable. At BUV we have a policy where we must review the mission every three years so that we remain in context. In other words, the world's changing around us very, very fast. And that's what you were just mentioning. Mm -hmm. People don't focus on the outcomes. They yep. put something in place and then that remains there where it needs to change. Otherwise, the mission becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we focus on redoing it. And we've just gone through our uh, a mission review and I was mm -hmm. delighted to see. Mm -hmm. The process is, the mission's not mine. Mm -hmm. um, it's the students, it's the staff, it's other stakeholders that we have. We involve all of them in the formation of our mission. And for me, I was delighted to see a value proposition come back from that process, from the students in particular. So now, it's the very first statement in our mission is that we want to create graduates who are first and foremost good people mm -hmm. with an ethics of caring and kindness. Now, as well as everything else, discipline, skills, and and so forth. But to see that come back indicates to me that our students are brilliant and really watching the world and learning about the world and learning from us in how to assess things mm. and deconstruct things and whether or not the behaviour they're seeing is, is making a difference to oh, the world. We, we have not yet hired a BUV graduate. Yeah. Um, that's mostly because our headquarters is here, but sure. uh, I will be on the lookout. Yeah, uh, that's great to hear. A little bit inspired by your chat just now about that. Ray, you mentioned the connection of how students, you know, certain values, but also you mentioned the, the need to be adaptable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially in periods of uncertainty uh, and the need for innovation. I want you to just touch upon that a little bit more because most schools and the universities I see in Vietnam or around the globe, they're very methodical, mm -hmm. they're very structured. Yeah. Um, and like, even for instance, I see uh, here at my company, when I bring up new ideas such as adoption of AI, mm -hmm. you can see who's really open to it and the others that are a bit more confused or, mm -hmm. or perhaps sure. even not understanding what to do next mm -hmm. when given those new tools. Yeah. Maybe you can touch upon that and reflect how the BUV culture in your eyes uh, really tries to keep that in mind? Well, it's absolutely essential. The mission is about innovation, mm -hmm. preparing people who can thrive mm -hmm. in a very challenging world with, that will be destable. But that has opportunities as well mm -hmm. and excitement. And coming back to what you just said, it was very difficult for me when I first came to BUV too mm -hmm. because the culture was very rigid yes, and yeah. within zones and it had a very strong, a strong authoritarian approach to management. Uh, uh, this way or the highway. Yeah, sort of intricate. thing, you know. And, and really that's, look, a university is a learning environment. You know, there is no room in learning environments mm -hmm. for that type of culture because mm. it's run by fear. 
people are not going to speak out. How, how did you break down those barriers? Yeah, it was really quite difficult. Um, first of all, that uh, uh, you know, I have to be honest and say people mm-hmm. could not tell me mm-hmm. what they were doing mm-hmm. or what BUV did when I first came. Mm-hmm. They can now. Mm-hmm. So the first thing was to establish the mission. Kind of like the each individual person's purpose. Like yeah, why am is. I here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Why am I here? How does what I do contribute to this organisation mm. and what it's doing to contribute to Vietnam? Mm. And so that's the first thing we did. It's it's actually the management of power. Yeah. And yeah. so I do, you know, I look at your offices. I have to say, uh, listeners, if you ever get a chance, come and look at Vicetra or Vietcetera because... Uh, your offices are designed to facilitate excitement, mm. collaboration. You are bringing people design- together so that they, they, they learn. You know, there's no spatial demarcation of power and, and so forth, you know, and you've got lots of exciting, beautiful art mm. around them, exciting colours. You know, that's the design of our campus too. Mm. You know, they need, you need great spaces that facilitate people coming together and wanting to talk, mm. wanting to give their opinion, not being afraid to do so. So we redesigned the spatial arrangements. Mm. We redesigned the structure and took away authority, engaged in team and most importantly, we, we introduced ideation. Mm-hmm. And so now we have rewards for the best ideation for the year, uh, the Vice Chancellor's Award for ideation, as well as teaching, as well as research. But it's also about facilitating that mission too. And also within our students, mm-hmm. every subject that we do, mm-hmm. they're engaged in ideation. It's, it's not just saying we're doing ideation. We actually follow the process. Let's touch upon that. Sure. I'm, I'm very curious uh, in an individual point of view, what does ideation mean in, in your eyes and how do you measure that and how do you award that okay. as well? Let me go back one point. Individuals can be creative, mm-hmm. but I communicate to my staff and students, you cannot ideate on your own. You must have other people because people as individuals are not necessarily aware that their knowledge they have mm-hmm. is not just a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because it prevents you from that being able to see things. Mm. Say, for instance, a person who studies engineering, like myself before, uh, they study engineering. They practice engineering. A marketer studies marketing, practices marketing. A finance person studies finance, practices finance. It leads to a thing called practical consciousness or a discourse that constrains the way you think and see the world. And so what's really important is that we use, for me then, innovation is also a set of processes Mm -hmm. where we bring people with different knowledge bases, different ideas together to help us. You know, if I have a person that's completely different to me, culture as well, different cultures, uh, students are involved in our staff ideation exercises because they're much younger from different generations and so forth as well. So diversity becomes very, very important for, for innovation. And then they engage. But the engagement process needs to be facilitated as well. You know, they must stand up at BUV. Mm-hmm. You know, not sit down. And, they use post-its. They use different colours. They pull things into categories and so forth. But it's all very active and mm-hmm. I- integrated and... So that it uh, facilitates, if you like, that, uh, that movement and participation so that people begin to overcome their own knowledge boundaries. I hope that helps with what it I'm does. trying it does. to say. I mean, to me, it, that's what ideation is. It's a process yeah. that enables people to come up with ideas that they'd never brought to the table. Yeah, in, in American English, at least, we have a saying, um, you don't know what you don't know. Absolutely. And sometimes when you're only, let's say, an engineer and you're studying engineering, you might be the best in the class yeah, sure. or the whole university yeah, sure. for that matter. But if you've never studied an, another subject like English or psychology or something, and you're not expected to, sure. but if, if you've never had that exposure, even one class or even one discussion, uh, you may be limiting 
yourself. And sure. actually, it brought back memories of my own uh, university education. Uh, we had a certain system where I declared mathematics as my uh, degree when I entered. Uh, but my first year seminar, they had these like smaller class sure. settings. Most were like 50, 100 people, but there was one that was only 15. And for this particular seminar, they intentionally place you in a seminar of a totally different category. Yeah. So in my case, I studied sociology for ah, that seminar. Great. And I ended up graduating as a sociology major, actually. Very interesting. I, I gave up my mathematics degree at the very end. Um, in, I didn't take that one last class. Similar thing. But when I went to study my MBA, a whole world opened up. Because in it, but it was also I was very critical mm -hmm. of myself in that I saw that I was very narrow in my yeah. my frameworks because I studied philosophy, sociology, mm. and in fact my thesis is really a sociology mm. thesis. I think everybody should study sociology. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, fantastic. Opens up the world. Yeah. Um, Ray, you, you come from a very rigid background in engineering. Uh, it's, it's all very formulaic. Uh, it's written in the books. And then you obviously took more leadership classes and sociology and the likes. Um, I want to touch upon uh, the significance of this experiential learning. You mentioned oh, yes, sure. like everything from engagement to activity-based. How about like internships and professional activities? Yeah. How does BUV think about that in a student's education? Okay. Well, once again, it comes down to two principles, innovation, diversity. Mm -hmm. Students need a diverse wide, of, uh, a, a wide, or let's say a diverse set of experiences. In the majority of cases, the students are going to move into a work environment and they will, that will be alien to them. They've spent their time in high school mm -hmm. and I have to say high schools are quite rigid mm -hmm. also, yep. um, becoming less so, but Work environments are very different. And often, um, young, young people don't necessarily know how to behave, mm. you know, to realise their interests. And so that's what, that's what we, t we teach them. We have a, a personal and social growth program as well, where we actually engage, for instance, in, um, you know, understanding organisations and the power of uh, the nature of power in organisations. See, a person, a young person, runs the risk of losing their voice if they go into a work environment and behaves in a way that their elders or the management don't, don't appreciate. Mm. So they need to be able to read those things too. How, how to manage up? Well, yeah, well you, could, you could, um, yeah, we could call it manage up, but I'd like to say it's a little bit more than that. It's, it's, it's about being able to map their environments. Mm. In a way, it's kind of a, a sociological yeah. approach to things. That should, there should be an entire class about that. Oh, well, there is. <laughs> oh, there is, okay. Yeah, yeah BUV, there is. Uh, well, yeah. really? In fact, I often, oh, I often it teach Sorry? it as well. Um, well, it's in our personal and social growth programs. Okay, okay. You know, we have our disciplines, uh -huh. but we also have this fantastic... Uh, personal social growth program, which is compulsory too, by the way. Okay. So they're uh, kind of doing two degrees. You know? mm. And really what we're doing there in that personal and social growth program is preparing students for the world they're about to go into mm. so that they can realise their interest. It may well be their interest is to, is to change the world, but they'll need to, they'll need to understand that they can't make change if they lose their voice. Mm. By that I mean if they behave inappropriately, no one's going to listen to them. They'll think they're nonsense. Uh, and young people are young people. You know, they, they haven't necessarily had that experience. But young people throughout history have changed the world too. But it's those ones who really understand how to map a given situation or context so that they can achieve their interests. I, I really love what you just said, the whole mapping thing. Yeah. Yeah. Even as leaders, we need to do that as well. Oh, sure, um, absolutely. You sometimes forget about that, and um, it, mm -hmm. it goes both ways. But especially for young people, how do you see your career developing within that environment? Mm. Uh, not enough of them think about that. And also, what do you want to achieve? Mm. You know, many younger people don't yeah. necessarily know um, exactly what they want to achieve. Mm. As it could well. just be in 30 days. It doesn't yeah. have to be two years. I mean, it is nah, sure. a lot of pressure. And it so. may well change. Yeah. You changed from mathematics to yeah. a sociology yeah. major. Exactly. So yeah. that, that, to me, that's wonderful. Mm. That's about learning. Mm. You entered a learning environment. I realized, I realized it was too difficult, <laughs> too competitive. <laughs> that's probably why. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Well, 
But I want to touch upon that, the, the idea of this traditional job role or traditional education, like mathematics, very important. Please go study math. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, not it's not. But I'm still into quantum mechanics, sure. you know, even though I'm a philosopher and sociology yes. and I'm into all different things. But right at the moment, I'm really turned on by what's happening in quantum mechanics. Very well. good. In a world where these, these roles are evolving, and by that I mean, uh, for example, at Viet Cetera, we're content creators. We, mm. we create content. Now, am I a content creator? Sure, but we have a lot of people on our team. They love making one minute videos um, and some of them are quite significant followers on, on social media. And I think for even my generation, I'm not like that much older, I kind of scoff at like, oh, content creator, is that a job? <laughs> and then I've realized over the years at Vietcetera and as our industry has evolved, it mm. is a job. And it sure. you don't have to necessarily be a celebrity, right? Yeah. That's not what I'm saying, it's more like, there's a generation of new jobs and careers that are evolving and and how do we prepare for this next generation to think in that kind of way right how do we explore these unconventional career paths i'm not saying be a content creator that's up to you to decide but um and to embrace those kind of trajectories and characteristics what are your thoughts about that from perhaps a personal point of view or and or yeah, sure. point of view from a personal point of view and i actually this is this is one of the sessions you know, I don't lecture so well. I do. I get into the classroom as often as I can. You know, but uh, when I was a professor and teaching and researching, I am a professor still. But uh, one of the it's a little session I had because I have a problem with the word career. Mm. You know, like, uh, and if I re reflect upon myself, uh, my career, <laughs> my job, my job life. Mm -hmm. moved through an epoch in time, mm -hmm. which was what was open systems. Mm -hmm. And the world changed. So I would say I never really had a career. And I try to get this, my students to understand this because they're about to move out into it and we're about to move into another epoch, mm -hmm. AI, mm -hmm. where for me it was not about a mapped out career. What was important... Well, let me say this. If someone had told me when I first entered university from high school that I'd be a professor and that I was, would eventually be a vice chancellor and president of a university, I probably would have been ill because mm -hmm. it was the furthest thing from my mind. I would never have thought or dreamt that that would happen. Mm -hmm. But what happened in my career was I was always back at university. I was always... Uh, acquiring skills because what what I realized very quickly in changing times uh, it's not stable and you're absolutely right content content creators didn't exist in that uh, there was no such a term mm -hmm. uh, in my time there used to be only journalists yeah, which journalists still exist still exist of course you know so what it, what it indicates is that um, and let me also say the roles in many of the jobs that existed when I was a young person are just gone the technology's gone, particularly when you worked in computer industries and communications. It's just industries have revolutionised. So for me, what was important was at any one time in my life, how many doors were open for me if I needed to, if something went wrong or I wanted to change. So the most important thing for a young person uh, as they move into the future, particularly one that's going to be radically changing like, like we're moving into, is to ensure that they've always have an inventory of doors in front of them that if they need to, they can walk through mm. or take one that's relevant, the best one to walk through for the context in which they find themselves. So that means to me, you need to be constantly and continuously learning how to relearn. That's great. I, I love learning how to relearn. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned AI a few times. Mm. Uh, is that is that of a personal interest? I mean, I assume yes, but also how does BUV think about those transformational technologies, epochs, I guess you could say, sure. things like AI? Maybe AI, you can from you about that. BUV at the moment are all over it mm. in a colloquial term. I'd love to hear in what ways, like, you know, day-to-day -day student implementation, like curriculum and, and teaching, or is it more on the okay. like building departments all around that? BUV understands its mission is to prepare people for the future, mm -hmm. young people to thrive. AI is, is here and it is going to revolutionise everything that we do and how we do things. 
And so what we're doing now is we're doing our due diligence, you know, with governance systems and so forth as well, not just doing AI, but how can we do it? What's the ethics that we want to engage with? What's the, the impact that it's going to have? What, uh, ha what type of insights can we gain about the types of how it's going to impact society and the world so that we can actually then have that linked down into our curriculum? so that we can prepare people for what's going to happen mm. in the best way that we can. We really don't know exactly what's going to happen, but our research can give us insight and pictures into what's going to un unfold. And then we also engage with our staff, and uh, we also, we've run a number of different pilot sessions now on how we can use it in, inside of the organisation from an operational point of view for productivity enhancements. Mm -hmm. and. You know, for all intensive purposes, it's wonderful and they enjoy it as well. So there's great opportunities for people with this. And then, for instance, then we've also had uh, instantaneously um, a number of universities, for instance, throughout the world are saying, no AI, you're not allowed to use it. Mm -hmm. well, forget it. It is going to happen. They yeah, said that right. about the internet exactly. in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. You know, it is going to happen. So we're more about working with our students so that they learn how to use it, mm. you know, in an ethical way and in a, an appropriate way for the benefit of themselves and others. Mm. So we, we, we are completely now, um, if you like, at the embryonic uh, stage of engaging with AI in our curriculums, in our uh, technology for learning and also within our operations. Okay. This ties in very well with the whole idea of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Sustainability comes in my eyes in kind of two ways sustainable business practices, like how do we run organizations sustainably, but also the more environmental things, which is yeah, what sure. most people think of when we mention the word sustainable. Yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that particular topic as well. Uh, from what I understand and, and from what I've seen physically at the campus, let's say, it's integrated in the architecture, yeah, it is, yeah. um, in, into the spaces but also perhaps in the teaching. I mean, yeah, I've never is. been taught at BUV, but I assume that's a, a, a key point. That yeah, you sure. I look at sustainability in a way that um, it struggled, the sustainability lens, both from an ecolog ecological point of view, but also sustainable business. Mm. It struggled for legitimacy. Mm. And you can understand that too when you, know, you look at countries around the world where people are more more worried about having food on the table than they are necessarily about um, uh, sustainability principles and, uh, and so forth. So what's been really important, I followed the, if you like, the political lens as well on this uh, and how it's been able to, to gain legitimacy. And I'm, I'm so glad that it has. So there's an altruistic point, you know, we really want to do the best thing for the future and, and leave a, a world that... Uh, that uh, people can flourish in, our children and our grandchildren and so forth. But without legitimacy, it'll be difficult to do that. And uh, it's been able to now fight and, uh, and, and acquire legitimacy right throughout the world. Now for Vietnam, and I'm thinking about sustainability for Vietnam and its lens and its legitimacy. Um, Vietnam, you know, it's an emerging economy and there are people who are, uh, who are interested in food on the table as well. And so it's difficult, it's been difficult for the sustainability lens to gain legitimacy inside of Vietnam. However, in recent times, some things have happened. Vietnam, in order to emerge, uh, to, to continue to move forward in its development, needs foreign investment or needs investment. Mm. And now all of the large-scale investment funds have announced that they will not engage or give funds to projects who are not considering sustainability principles and practices. Mm. And your government has now, or the Vietnamese government, has now said they want to move towards um, carbon neutrality by 2050. Mm -hmm. The message is clear now. That means that all small businesses and businesses will be subjected to regulatory or regulation that, uh, that will demand uh, sustainability. So that it's going to, in a way, push and, and force uh, Vietnam to move on that in that particular 
when, when people say and think of sustainability, and I was a suspect of this many years ago when mm -hmm. I was a bit younger, I guess, um, we associate that word with a challenge, uh, difficulty, mm -hmm. expensive, mm -hmm. uh, which may or may not be true. And how does that apply to things like accessibility? So my question for you, Ray, is in the university context, those sound like all great things. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure uh, it takes a lot of effort and time and money to do that. But at the same time, it could remove accessibility yeah, in sure. a way, right? In terms of, especially for students, mm -hmm. we invest so much into these very good, perhaps necessary changes, but it does inhibit accessibility for students to join that environment, perhaps. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and sure. how BUV, if anything, has done to do both at the same time if yeah. possible. Yeah, very important to us uh, and very important. It's a fundamental measure in an economy uh, or for sustainability of an economy. And I think what you mentioned, you're considering or, or talking about is, is mobility. Mm -hmm. And in an economic sense, mobility is the ability for a lower, uh, or let's say a person that with um, lower income, lower income and so forth, their ability to be actually better themselves. Mm -hmm in education and in standard of living. Mm. And it's a fundamental uh, measure, as I just mentioned, say the World Bank and other types of economic uh, uh, watches are always looking at mobility in economies. And so it's a very, very important thing. And for BUV, BUV is a private institution positioned in a premium segment of the market. Yes, yeah. Now, the reason we're positioned in a premium segment of the market is because we, our business model you know, demands it. Mm -hmm. So we can't sustain ourselves, sustainability, unless we position ourselves in a particular way. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is we can provide doors that open up for people from uh, lower economic positions within, within the economy, within Vietnam, to have access. And uh, that's what we do. That's the primary focus of our scholarship system. Mm -hmm. But not just that. Universities are all about um, uh, how they serve their communities. And so uh, I'd love to show you the things that our academics and our students are doing too in order to engage with that level of, of, uh, of communities mm -hmm. in order to help them better themselves as well. And as we move forward, and our, our business model becomes stronger. You are right, we've, we're, we're a relatively new university and we need to have a certain number of students before we can, we can weather, if you like, the storm of change and in jolts to the, to the actual business. And, and for our audience that's not too familiar with BUV, at least the size and the ambition of where it wants to be, so how many students currently? Yeah, we have about 2,500 students. And, and where now. do you see that? going in the future? Yeah, we, we expect to have more than 3,000 at the end of this year. One of our key goals is to move to 5,000 students as fast as we can. Mm. You've seen the campus, it is magnificent, and in actual fact it's, it's been voted as one of the best campuses in Southeast Asia. Okay. And uh, please, if you go to our website, have a look at, the, we have a video there about the master plan for where it will go. We're, we're in the middle of phase two mm -hmm. now, been constructed at this okay. stage. It'll be finished by January 2025, and then in 2028 we'll finish phase three. And by and phase three, it'll 10,000 no, students? 10,000, okay. with the option, we're designing it with flexibility so that we can actually, uh, if it grows further, we can take on more students okay. as well. Yeah. But a university needs to get the 5,000 students mm -hmm. uh, in order to have a revenue flow that enables it to then weather things like scale, COVID or some other type of jolt and so forth. In other words, high fixed costs you've got to get returns on. Mm -hmm. But then also to serve the community yep. with research, to serve the community with um, creating opportunities mm -hmm. for uh, mobility. Mm -hmm. And that's completely within our sustainability lens yep. and our model for moving forward, our business model for moving forward. Very good. Well, talking about moving forward in the future, uh, what kind of legacy do you see BUV leaving in 10 years' time or perhaps longer? I okay. uh, would love to hear your vision behind that. Sure. It's kind of influenced by me personally as well in that um, I, 
I often refer to myself as a Nietzschean Democrat. Okay. Which is kind of a paradox. So, um, you know, that means I'm, I'm a Democrat, you know, but I'm also a pragmatist, mm. you know. And um, so for me, legacies are not what I'm interested in necessarily. You know, I'm interested in people and bringing people together. Uh, so, if, but if there was a legacy, and this would be BEV's legacy as well, okay. it's in our students. Mm. Well, hopefully more of them will be working at Vietcetera very soon. Yeah. Um, I'll, be, I'll be on the lookout personally. Thank you, Ray, for, for that insightful sharing about um, education at large and sure. little tidbits about leadership and power and, and management. I think uh, I personally learned a lot today, and I'm sure our audience has some follow-up questions. Um, if you have any comments, questions, please leave them in the chat box and we'd be happy to get to them and perhaps share a bit more information to you guys later and better inform about what kind of content we could be making for you guys. So to wrap up today's podcast, we're just going to do some rapid fire questions with Ray. Uh, these questions are designed for you guys to quickly understand some of the new values and new missions that BUV has been building towards. Uh, so Ray will be answering them here today. Let's get started, Ray. Yep, sure. So our first question is, what is BUV's new mission all about? It's about creating uh, outstanding, disciplined graduates uh, who have an ethic of caring and kindness for humans, non-humans, and the world. Could you tell us about a program that encourages students to come up with innovative ideas for sustainability and entrepreneurship? All of our program programs are underpinned by, by ideation, but it's about discovery-based pedagogy and uh, innovation. All right, Ray, next question. Give us an example of a project related to sustainability that the university has carried out. Once again, all of our programs have uh, sustainability underpinning them, so it's the curriculum. But then also, if it's one thing, take a look at the uh, eco pavilion in our new, f or f in phase two of our campus. How does BUV use unique teaching methods or technologies to enhance learning? It's referred to as discovery-based pedagogy, as I just mentioned, but even new or more uh, recent, we have what's called PIL, which is purpose-based impact mm -hmm. learning, which is all about discovery and making an impact in the world and demonstrating it. In one sentence, how does BUV inspire its faculty and staff to keep learning and innovating in the context of sustainability education? First of all, it's in our recruitment policy or the way we recruit. We want academics who are about continuous learning and engaging with our students and demonstrating to them the need for learning how to relearn, which is about understanding that the knowledge you have may not be relevant in the very near future. So you'll need to relearn. Thank you, Dr. Raymond Gordon, for all your sharing today. Um, it's been great to hear about your insights and uh, wish you the best and the team about that long-term vision that you have for BUV Hanoi mm -hmm. and well, Vietnam. And well, well. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I really enjoyed the questions. Very good. Very, very good. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I thought a lot about this. So uh, the leadership in particular topic. So um, thank you so much, guys. Uh, it's another episode of Vietnam Innovators with Hao, your host uh, today. Um, if you're wanting more of our content, Please remember to subscribe and follow wherever you get our podcasts, and we'll be delivering that every single week to you guys. Thank you so much, and see you next time. Yeah. Goodbye. Ciao.